Hey friends, just the gems. I'm Brandon. Recently, YouTuber Inferno Fox Gaming put out a video titled My Video Game Hot Takes That Are Only Positive. And I loved that video. I love that idea for a topic. So consider this my response video. Do people do response videos anymore? I think they do. I think they do. They should if they don't. Because that's what YouTube is. It's a conversation between me and you and all the other creators out there. We're all just talking at each other and it's a lot of fun and I want to do some of that. So I wanted to make a video going over some of my hot takes, my spicy takes that are not crapping on somebody else's joys, not making anybody feel bad about the things that they're into, but talking about things that I think are positive and that I enjoy that other people might disagree with for a variety of reasons. And we can go into that. And who knows this, I might decide to make this a regular, a regular recurring thing on this channel because I just think it's a great idea. Like I'm primarily about positivity. I'm not the sort of like happy all the time. Like everything's gotta be positive. Sometimes when something sucks, it just sucks and you have to be honest about it. But for the most part, I don't think that happens all that often. And you can just be positive and have a good time without, you know, bringing down anybody else. So the idea of taking on uh, positive hot takes just really appeals to me um, in a lot of ways. So I'm gonna give it a shot. Why don't we give it a shot? Got my notes here somewhere. Okay. What order do I want to do these in? The first one, okay, so the first one I want to talk about, I guess it's going to sound like a negative because I'm, I'm saying that we need to get rid of something. But it's actually a positive, and just hear me out. My first positive gaming hot take is that there should not be console-exclusive games. Hang on. Whoa, hang, hang on. Whoa, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Calm down. You don't need fire. Your response does not need to involve fire. That's dangerous. You're going to hurt somebody. What I'm, what I'm saying is exactly what you're hearing. I don't think that there should be games that are exclusive to a console. Mario should not be only on Nintendo. The Last of Us should not be only on PlayStation. Halo should not be and isn't only on Xbox, okay? Why is this a positive hot take? Well, I think this is positive because ultimately it means more games for more people. If we remove this kind of artificial barrier that has been constructed for the profit and benefit of these very few monolithic companies, by the way, not for my benefit, not for your benefit, but for the benefit of the profit of these companies, we get rid of that barrier, all of a sudden we have so many more games available to anybody who wants to play them. I actually, you know, as much as I have not been a fan of Microsoft from the beginning, they just never really kind of vibed with my whole thing. They tried a little bit in the 360 generation, they got some pretty decent JRPGs on their platform, but overall their focus on games as a service and shooters and, jock games, I guess, for lack of a term that's not that. But they, they haven't really been up, they haven't really been up my alley, haven't been my cup of tea. But I think that what they've been kind of moving towards, you know, putting their games, the games that they own, that they created onto other platforms, that's, that's good. That's good for us, actually. I think Microsoft is doing a lot of other things that are not so good for us, like pushing the subscription-based model is not good for us. It's not good for developers. It's good right now. It feels good on the wallet. It feels good having a lot of things to play. But in the long run, it's not going to be good for us for a lot of reasons. I'm not going to go into it right now. But I do think the idea of putting games on other platforms is the, is the right idea. And I think that not just other platforms, but every platform. The reason that I feel this way is it's, it's strange to me that video games are the only art form where we do this, right? Like, when you buy a movie, let's say Quentin Tarantino, all right? You heard of him? I think he did Kill Bill, maybe? Yeah, he did the Kill Bill movies. I know movies, guys, come on. Quentin Tarantino puts out a new film, right? And Sony produces it. Let's say even, let's, let's use one of, our, one of our examples. Sony produces this new film by Quentin Tarantino. I don't have to purchase a Sony Blu-ray player to watch the new Quentin Tarantino film produced by Sony because it's a movie. 
like you can just watch a movie on whatever you have. You can put it in your computer. You can you can put it in anything. Basically, nowadays, you can watch a movie, right? When you buy something digitally, if I want to buy the movie digitally, I don't have to go and just buy it or just stream it through Sony's online repository. I can buy a digital copy on Amazon. I can get it on Apple. I can get it on whatever, right? There isn't this artificial gatekeeping of content behind a monolithic company. It's just, it's a movie. Obviously, you're not going to like hide a movie, but like, why would you do that? You want more people to see the movie, right? Now, thinking about it in more detail, um, would movie studios have done this if they thought that they could get away with it? Yeah, I bet, I bet you they would have. I bet they would have. But the fact is that this precedent was sort of established that you don't need this proprietary machine in order to experience this art. You just, there. the art is there, and we make the machines to accommodate the art. We don't make the art to accommodate the machine. And that, to me, is the ideal state for video games, where we have a platform, whether it's your computer, something on the television, whatever it may be, a handheld device, that has access to everything. That if I want to purchase a game, digitally, I'm assuming, right, because most things are going digital and I'm realistic, if I purchase a game digitally, whether it's on the Nintendo Entertainment System or on the PlayStation 2 or on the Xbox Series X, if it's whatever, whatever game I buy, I can play it on this device, on my device for playing games. It doesn't matter who made the device, what company manufactured it. Other companies can get involved and make their machines. They'll have the same specs will just decide this is the standard. This is the standard. It's worked in other media. There's no reason it can't work here. Worked in music, worked in movies. I was going to say books, but I mean, that's a little bit of a stretch. I mean, that's words on paper. But still, like, you don't have to buy a proprietary device to read a particular book, even though there were proprietary e-readers, right, for, like, the Kindle, and I think Barnes & Noble had one, the Nook, I want to say. I used to work there. I should know this. It doesn't matter. But there were proprietary devices that, you know, would only work with their online storefronts, you could, you know, sideload books or whatever. So that was kind of like, and those didn't, those, those were kind of weird because it was like, well, I don't want to just buy from Barnes and Noble. Like well, I want to buy a book from here. or I want to buy a book online for directly from the author and be able to load it onto my device separately. So I think that the instinct of these companies is to find ways to put up a walled garden around the experience and make you buy the hardware. But when when the new Nintendo system comes out in 2028, 2030, you know, whenever the Switch 2 is coming out, when that system comes out, okay, we're going to buy it. I'm going to be first in line. I'm going to buy it. Of course I am. I love, I love video games. But in a way, we're kind of the chumps for continuing to perpetuate this bad decision that was made ages ago when we set up these incompatible and conflicting methods for delivering games into our homes so that's that's my first hot take is that we shouldn't have console exclusives they don't benefit us right they don't benefit us they benefit the companies that own these monopolies i've heard it argued that there could be some uh increased competition right between between these companies because they have their own devices and i would argue that where the competition really needs to happen is not in the specs of the machines or the capabilities of the machines, but in the games and the contents of the games. And that competition already exists. Game companies are fighting against each other all the time. First party developers are fighting against second party developers on the same console, right? Like it's, it's already a very competitive marketplace. Anybody can make a game nowadays. Like I probably could, I'd have to cheat a lot and use AI for everything, but like I could probably make a game if I really wanted to. I don't, that sounds exhausting. Props to you guys who do it. I just couldn't do it. I don't have the patience. I can barely get one of these videos out. It's been 11 minutes and I'm like, have I been here for three hours? No, I'm just kidding. I love talking to you guys. All right, so that's first hot take out of the way. Let's get rid of console exclusives. We don't need them. We don't need them. My second positive gaming hot take is I think that video game remasters and remakes even a generation later are fantastic. I think they are wonderful. I think they're great. I love that so many games are getting remade or remastered, even 
less than 10 years after they originally came out. Why is that? Why do I think that that's great? Well, let me look at it from the perspective of what I've heard a lot of people argue, like when they've been arguing against why remasters and remakes should be like, oh, you know, this remake or this remaster that Naughty Dog is doing for The Last of Us Part Two, say, that's a, a recent example. Oh, they're taking development teams away and they're having them work on these remasters. They could be making new games, right? They could be making The Last of Us Part Three, but instead they're remastering The Last of Us Part Two, a game that just came out like three years ago. And look, I understand kind of the instinct behind that, but it's important to keep in mind that the number of people that are required to put together a remaster of a game, especially one that's already pretty solid, <laughs> right last of us part two but really just remastering a game is not taking the team of 100 or 150 developers that a new game is taking right this is a small team that is being put to work on this project for another thing uh, another positive that i see from this is that in especially in today's industry when things are so tumultuous turbulent times people are losing their jobs left and right so many freaking layoffs enough that finally jeff Keeley had to say something about it which is nuts if you think about it he actually had to open his mouth and say something the world we live in right but it keeps people in jobs right like if they're working on a remaster i guess if the if the choice is between making a remaster of a popular game and letting those people go let's let them make the remaster you know, like let's let's put that remaster out in the world. Plus, if that remaster makes money for the company, if things are being run well, which again, I mean, that's a big if, but if things are being run well, that additional revenue means that that company has more financial stability to be able to fund more games, right? So that's good for them and it's good for us. Also, and finally, and this is the argument that I've heard in favor of remakes and remasters most frequently, and I agree with it, is that remakes and remasters make very good games much more easily available and playable for people that missed them right whether or not it's because you were too young to play a game maybe you were, weren't even born when it came out or you just missed it right like we, we i talked about in my previous hot take that these console machine boxes are fixed they're locked to like one generation of games often and sometimes you can't go back and play games from a previous generation on this new piece of hardware up until recently that was kind of the norm i mean sporadically we'd get backwards compatibility in some machines but like it wasn't consistent it wasn't a norm and it's barely a norm now so it gives an opportunity for people to be able to play these games right and it also gives a, a chance to the developers to be able to maybe iron out some some wrinkles, right? Smooth off some rough spots on the game that they are not happy with. Like, I don't know if, if you've ever made anything, but I've done it with YouTube videos and other things that I've made. Like I have a novel that I put out and it's it's out there in the world and it's, it's in print and like, I can't look at it because I'm like, there's things in there that I wish I would have done differently. And it just, it just drives me nuts. I can imagine for a game, it's gotta be that times a million because I could technically go back, revise my book and well, I would have to get another publisher, but, but you know, like you can make revisions to a book fairly easily and a new edition of book can come out, but a video game, it's a bigger deal. Like trying to fix a video game or make changes to a video game. It's a, it's a bigger undertaking for a game that's, you know, in the past, one that's not being actively developed. So maybe they have an opportunity to go back and kind of smooth off those rough edges. And I say, hey, that's great. More power to you as, as, as a creator, right? It's, it's just hard for me to think of it solely as a cynical cash grab. Like, yeah, I think that does happen, right? It does. There are companies that are just cynically trying to cash in on every last little cent they can. They put the minimum effort behind a remaster to put out a minimally viable product. Oftentimes we've seen some remasters that just don't work when they come out because they were not given the care that they deserve. That's not what I'm talking about. I understand that that's gonna happen, but that happens with brand new games in this industry nowadays because of the powers that be at the top of these corporations that are trying to push these games out super fast for very little money. So, you know, like that's gonna happen, but I'm, I'm talking about the genuine efforts made by people that care about the games. And I am not cynical to the point where I think that everybody is that sort of money-minded evil corporate person, right? That's not 
I'm not at that level of cynicism yet. And I mean, I'm 40, so like, I don't think I'm probably changing much from this point. I knock on wood that something doesn't completely like shatter my world and change my worldview completely. But I just, I just don't think that that's likely to happen. So that's hot take number two. Hot take number three. This is, might even be hard for me to say, because I understand what this means and it's gonna, I think this positive hot take is gonna make some people pretty angry. I think Final Fantasy XV is good and beautiful. Yep, it's true. It remains one of my favorite Final Fantasy games. I think it's in my top five for sure. Might maybe even my top three. Um, I think that it is just an astonishing achievement in a very particular kind of storytelling. So it is a story that is told completely differently than any other Final Fantasy, and honestly, than any other, most any other video game that I've ever seen, okay? It's a incredibly focused story where 95% of the time you are only seeing and experiencing what is happening to the main characters, specifically to Noctis, who is the main dude. The, the rest of the happenings in the world are just kind of experienced through the eyes of this kid who is on the road on his own for the first time and all these horrible things are happening in his life to his family he's losing his family he's losing his kingdom he's he's losing everything and the fact that he has his closest friends with him to support him through all of that trial and tribulation is just it's beautiful because it, it's it's a it's a big story, right? It's a Final Fantasy. It's a big, like, world-altering story with giant eon summoned monsters and, you know, evil deposed kings and stuff. So, like, it's, it's a big story. But it's told through just the narrowest, most focused lens. And Noctis's story, his, his experience traveling with his friends, is just... To me, it's super moving. Like, I felt like I saw myself and my friends in those guys. Like, you know, it's, it's, it was a, such a cool experience to be like, these guys interact with each other the way I interact with my friends. Like, they just, they nailed this particular, I guess, male friendship dynamic really well from my perspective at least. I'm not saying everybody's friendships are that way or even every man's friendships are that way. And it's totally fine if you don't vibe with that and that's not your experience with friendship or it's not the kind of story you're interested in hearing. Um, it's also fine if you're not into absorbing all of the like additional outside material, right? Because Final Fantasy 15 to really truly understand the macro plot, you really need to kind of watch the movie and then the anime series and then there's books and there's all this supplementary ancillary material that goes along with the story of the game and to fully experience it yeah you do need to read and watch all of those things and if that's not up your alley that's fine it's different than like say the final fantasy 7 supplemental material because you can fully experience all the final fantasy 7 games without reading or watching any of that supplementary material and you're fine um final fantasy 15 there's a, sort of a requirement to if you want a full understanding of what's happening you do need to read all this stuff yeah i that's not going to be for everyone it's not going to be even for the majority of people it's probably going to be for very few and i happen to fall in that very few this time and i'm so grateful that this game was made because the emotions that it evoked in me as I got to go on this, you know, this journey with these characters and experience these things that they experienced with them was just, I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to explain, but just like so emotionally resonant. And I just felt such strong feelings for these characters. And it doesn't hurt that I also found the world so intriguing. I mean, maybe that's in part because you only see bits of it from the perspective of Noctis. And that, you know, that kind of not being able to see everything, not knowing everything, makes it all the more intriguing. And that's a that's a legit and very well used storytelling technique as well. But yeah, I just I think that Final Fantasy XV is an achievement. And 
I'm, I'm bummed in a way that it didn't resonate with more people. Um, I think that it will probably have something of a, of a renaissance in the years to come. Final Fantasy 13 is going through something similar right now. Every new Final Fantasy that comes out is bemoaned and hated for a period of time, and then it is eventually embraced by the people who love it. Uh, because all the negative voices are bored and move on to something else, and it can just kind of leave the, the chorus of people that support and love the experience they had with it. I think that's going to happen with 15, like it's happened with so many other games uh, over the years. And I'm excited for when that happens, because there's a lot that I want to say about it, but if you bring up Final Fantasy 15 now, which I'm doing in this video, which is probably a stupid move, but bringing it up now, um, tend, people tend to jump down your throat and say like, oh, you're an idiot for liking this. I'm disliking this video. I'm unsubscribing because you like this game that I think is bad. That's, I mean, that's fine, I guess. Like, you know, I, I just, you know, like what you like and I, you know, everybody like what they like. I think that's fine. But I just, I think that for me, it was such a resonating experience and while it's a bummer that it didn't resonate with more people, I'm just very grateful that that team, you know, pushed through and put this game out. And I mean, I waited so long for it and it just didn't let me down. And I'm very grateful for that. Anyway, that's it. I just wanted to drop in with some positive hot takes. Thanks again to Inferno Fox Gaming for the wonderful idea that I shamelessly have stolen, or I guess responded to. We'll say responded to. But watch his video as well. His, the link to his video is down in the description. Check that out. Please leave me a comment. Let me know some of your positive hot takes. Really try to make them positive. I want to keep as much positivity going as we can because that makes me feel good by design. Anyway, that's all for now. Um, I hope that you enjoyed watching this. I hope that you'll stick around and watch more. And until next time, bye.